Well, welcome everybody to our second round of lightning talks. And let's go ahead and dive right into it. Our first presenter is Kevin, and his speech is how to measure open source score. Kevin? So, so today's topic is uh, how to measure open source score, right? Fine. So I think uh, there is a one thing in common between you all and me, right? That we all are, uh, you know, uh, interested about open source as a philosophy, right? And that's why we are here. So welcome all, and let me start my talk. So uh, before that, so these are the agenda on which uh, I will discuss in this five minute, okay? So the first thing I would like to share with all of you is. Uh, you know, my first Android mobile in 2010, right? This is like Samsung Galaxy Y. So when I, I'm about to purchase this phone, so at that time I'm not aware about coding and all the stuff, but one of my friend told me that, you know, uh, Android is something open source operating system. And what do you mean by open source when I asked them? So he's, he told me that, you know, open source is something where you can write your code and you can also publish your application, right? If you want to change anything in this operating system, you are free to do that, right? So at that time, I'm not much aware about coding, not today also, but I like that idea that, you know, as I, as an individual who can make the change in the code, right? So that was the fascinating idea to me. And that's why I purchased this phone and my first smartphone. Okay. And uh, yeah, now uh, let's talk about favorite food, right? So just, I want to connect this open source philosophy with, uh, it's a food, right? So I'm from Gujarat, India. So here the a food called Pani Puri is very famous and I like it very much. So just, I would like to tell you that, you know, the one thing is buy, right? So suppose I'm going to the shop, I will buy Pani Puri, I will eat and I enjoy, right? The second case is make, right? Now, if you think that I want to make it, right? So again, you can search on YouTube, the recipe and try to make it home, right? But there is some difference in the taste, right? Because I'm making the first time, right? And with some ABC Pani Puri Wala, which is very famous, or any brand is there, right? So there is a difference in taste, right? There is something USP they have as a, the taste and raw material, which I cannot make at the first time, right? And the third, uh, so when I see open source, I can also see like, uh, you know, there are some commercial software, there are some open source software, right? Commercial software, you can pay them amount and you can, uh, you know, purchase the right and you can use it, right? Uh, but you cannot modify it, right? So uh, here in open source, there is a liberty to modify also, right? And there is something called sell also. So you can sell under your name also, right? So suppose there is some ABC Pani Puri Wala is there, right? Suppose he thought that, you know, let us make this recipe as an open source so that everyone can, you know, modify the recipe and give their name to the brand and they can sell. So same way in open source also, right? Uh, the code is open. Anyone are free to do modification and also they can resell this uh, product in their name, right? So this way we all grow in open source, right? So now uh, accidentally core contributor at right? wordpress.org. So before two years only, I, you know, thought to let's develop a website. So I researched and, you know, then I come end up with that. Okay. WordPress is something, a software where uh, one can create a website for, I mean, the code is free and open source, right? So when I go deeper and started, uh, you know, small for contribution in that, so I can, we can see that there are different 10 types of contribution type, right? So that uh, this way, WordPress is recognized that, you know, the people who are making changes or basically contributing. So uh, one day I am, you know, uh, making my website and I find some bug, right? I'm not a developer. I'm not a technical person, but I find minor bug. So what I've done is I take a screenshot, right? And on GitHub, I just paste on particular WordPress page that, Hey, I'm uh, working on this and I find this work. Okay. So after some time, the people who are the, actually the core developer, they see and they check that yes, that is actually a bug. So they try work on that. And in next version, they have improved that bug. Right. And uh, now as a, as a, I'm not, I'm not actually testing this WordPress, but I'm using it and I find this bug accidentally. Right. And when I report them, so according to them, I uh, nothing but a core contributor. So in next version, they, you know, highlight, give me the credit as a core contributor and give me this badge. So in a way it feel good, right? When we get some badge or some get recognition, it feel good. So, uh, on this idea, if you go ahead, uh, there is something called translation contributor, right? So in the, in the world, there are so many I mean, different languages, right? 
one language is not enough to communicate all the world so that's why this code is also translating in different languages right so uh, suppose someone is not a uh, coder or technical person like me you at least can you know uh, contribute as a translation contributor you can translate the you know whole website or code in your mother language right so uh, this is something translation contributor which everyone can do that right and uh, this is my last slide right and uh, so there are so many ways to measure this open source core so one of the ways right so what we can do is uh, let's say let's talk about this uh, wordpress.org first right so uh, suppose uh, out of 10 we can give the score okay if someone has uh, contributed in so many areas 5 6 7 8 based on that we can hear the basic score is 8 right same way there is something called vlc media player mozilla firefox the browser ubuntu the operating system and liber office the you know office platform so uh, based on our contribution right we can uh, an agency can rate the score right now suppose i am only uh, involved in this five different open source project right so i will do this total which is 30 and i will i will take an average 30 divided by 5 which is 6 right so here i we land up as in a, a score which is 5.6 now how to read this uh, 5.6 hey here 5 means uh, which is this how many a uh, project you are contributing so 5 means i am contributing to five different uh, project right and 0.6 is nothing but average right that i am at which level so this is i think one of the way where we can you know measure this open source score and this way actually we can motivate all the people or the student or the newbies right to you know go ahead with that and start contributing so that they can improve that open source score and yeah so i think this is my from my side right so now uh, any question or any suggestion or how we can you know a better measure this open source score so yeah please next up we have jose lopez with open source program office to help and op on to help on open source sustainability hey Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on when you are looking at this uh, conference. And we are going to start talking about uh, uh, open, open source plan offices, how they are an important role for open source sustainability. Um, well, thank you very much for the organization to let me participate in this lightning talk. It's just five minutes, so let's go for it. And let's start by talking about OSPOS, open source plan office. I don't know how many of you know about it, but a uh, quick introduction to the concept is basically in an organization private, non-profit, whatever, there are uh, strong relationship with open source uh, software nowadays, either because they consume open source software, because they are hiring companies providing services, or they are using software internally to build their own technology, whatever. That's what I call inbound processes. But there are also outbound processes, and they are becoming more and more important, like contributing to existing open source projects, contributing upstream, or even companies and organizations releasing their own open source projects. And basically, the OSPO is the ones managing all, all these things, all these workflows happening in an organization. And I, I, I like to call them the rangers in the organization's open source ecosystem. First of all, because this idea of there is an ecosystem around my organization, uh, around open source, that I depend on it. Basically, I depend on the health of that ecosystem. Uh, my technology, my teams, my contributions are going to be important and going to be has an impact. And there are several areas of knowledge that need, need to be taken into account to manage an OSPO. First of all, legal related with IP licensing and all the stuff. Usually, that lawyers are worried about companies being sued. But also things related with people, like how I can attract talent for these open source projects to my organization, how I can retain talent, allowing my people to contribute to open source projects, or so even things like that are, are very important. And last but not least, engineering, from engineering point of view, if any technology is important, and nowadays that we are working or living in a software uh, world, it's basically any impact on, on the software that of, of my team or my organization is, has an impact on engineering. So I need to take care of all of that. So basically, it's a lot of different stuff. But uh, coming back to the topic I would like to highlight today is this uh, balance between consumers, contributors, and maintainers. This, this discussion is happening about, OK, there is no balance, and it's hard to keep the balance of organizations that are taking uh, open source and not contributing back. And I think that that's uh, that's important because uh, from my experience, consuming and even contributing open source software without care, like okay, let's let's use this software and it's open, so I can use it for free, 
or let's uh, release this open source software without taking care about any vulnerabilities or licensing problems or, or things even worse like that. It's very risky. And I think OSPO uh, and the people working in an OSPO has all the knowledge and the capability and the tools uh, to manage all of this in a, in a proper way. And I will say that the, the, the goal, one of the main goals for any OSPO should be like, okay, let's ensure the sustainability of, of the ecosystem, the open source ecosystem around our organization. And it's basically follow the path of, okay, let's try to move users to contributors, contributors to maintainers in the sense of, okay, let's create this culture of we are part of the ecosystem and we should be taking care, part, uh, taking care of this ecosystem to, to sustain, to survive, sorry. And of course, a lot of people are talking about funds and giving funds to projects and stuff like that. I, I, I would like to highlight one thing uh, among all the options that are on there, that hiring the small companies that are providing consulting, customization, even individuals that are providing services around the open source projects they maintain is one option. And companies should be moved to that. And I think that's very important. And I would like to highlight the not invented here syndrome that many companies like, oh, we can do that. We don't need to hire anyone. We can use this software by ourselves. Please avoid that and go and hire all these people. And that would be that would be my remarks for this lighting talk. Is basically OSPO manage a complex and diverse relationship with different uh, open source projects and this idea of open source ecosystem and you need this figure or this this organization inside your company. You should be taking care of your open source ecosystem because your sustainability and growth as an organization may depend on it. And of course, open source and code are not the limited resource here. Basically, the limited resource are the people maintaining this, this, this code. Um, hiring is an option. Avoid the not invented here syndrome. And I would say that that would be all from my side. I would like to highlight that we have a MES session later today. So please join us. I, I, the link is there. And that would be it from my side. Thank you very much. And Thank you so much. Our next presenter is Panos with Code Software, Choose the License Wisely. My name is Panos Kalarianis and my talk will focus on how to choose the perfect open source license for your software. Let's move on. Every day a big number of software are developed either to meet a need that does not exist or for a new idea that will bring major changes in science and technology. In any case, a software cannot be used by a user other than the author without a software license. In essence, the license is what gives the user the right to use the software. Under other circumstances, the user would be using it illegally. The two major types of open source software licenses are copyleft and permissive. It is emphasized that both types are considered open source and at the same time offer every right to the user for freedom of use without any restrictions. Let's see what each type of license is for. Copyleft licenses are those where the user can use, edit and redistribute the software freely, but providing the software, software code with the same license. This in turn means that once the software is subject to the copyleft license, it will not be possible to make any changes to a permissive license. Some valuable examples are GNU, GNU General Public License and Mozilla License. Permissive licenses are those that, when used in a software, the user can also use, edit and redistribute the software, but in this case, it is not now necessary to provide the same license. In short, after the redistribution, the software license may change. Some examples are the BSD license, MIT and Apache. Another issue that should be addressed by the person developing the software is this. Is the silent license going to be changed from permissive to copyleft and vice versa? If so, then it, it is very important that we understand the compatibility between software licenses. As far as permissive licenses are concerned, they can be converted to copyleft, but not the other way around. The reason, as we mentioned above, is because in copyleft licenses, the license should remain as it is. Here is a license usage chart. We can clearly see that the most used open source license is MIT, 
and this is due to GitHub projects. Before we rush to decide what type of license and which one fits our software, it would be a good idea to give some business answers to the following questions. What are the goals of the software? Is the development software intended for a company, for a research purpose, or of a service, or to assist the research conducted at the university? A worthwhile example is the following. If the software is intended for research conducted in a university, then it would be a very good idea for the license to be copyleft so that the code can be accessed anytime. How many technologies does it combine and what license do these technologies use? For this question, we should consider whether the software is a project from scratch or somewhat that uses libraries from other groups of developers. Since we have answered the above questions, it is very likely that we have come up with a license that suits us best. However, it is not excluded that the appropriate one has not been found. In this case, the multi-licensing licensing option is given. During multi-licensing, we may use one or more licenses for our software. Of course, in order to be theoretically and practically feasible, it will be good for our software to be from scratch so that there is no licensed library incompatible with ours. An example is the following. By creating a software, we can divide it into two versions, the community and the premium one. Undoubtedly, premium will provide more technologies, however, it, it will use a closed license, while the community one will be available to the public with an open source license. That was the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Up next, we have Sodifo with designer design from the dimensions of open source. So yeah, I'm um, sorry about the breach. Um, hi everyone, I'm going to be speaking today about design from the realm of open source. And so yeah, um, open source is new source set by a friend at the early upper team. Let's move forward. So uh, I do open source. My name is Shitiba Yomide. I do a lot of open source contribution on GitHub and creating projects out there. I am a senior developer advocate from Lagos, Nigeria. I do a whole lot of community work around Africa also on Stack Africa, Open Source Community Africa, Developer Circles Lagos on Facebook, Africa Hacks, and other communities out there. So yeah, let's get cooking. So designs can get less creative. Um, the more you produce design asset, the more creative you get over time. So Express is what exactly makes a great designer being able to contribute open source all the time. It's what makes um, a designer who contributes open source. So I can say I come to contribute open source because I've come to contribute open source over time, over time, over time, and that's the experience. So I can teach other people how to contribute open source as a designer. But then there are some limitations. Let's talk about that right now. So these are the problems now. This is some of the problems. So it's quite hard to find a single designer who contribute, contributes to open source efficiently. Um, perceptions of designers not needed in open source, but just make it work. So a lot of people say, okay, just, just make it work. No one really cares um, a whole bunch of things. So what they, just make it work. That's what everyone really cares about. And yeah, so that's wrong and that shouldn't be it. Yeah. So perception, yeah, to, to the solutions part. Um, yeah. So. This is solutions part. So resources tell us to how to control open source as it is not nice, fully needed um, over the internet. We have a lot of resources on how developers can contribute open source. Open source. We have all of that out there, but we have few resources to help um, designers contribute to open source. So yeah, thanks to organizations like um, the Open Source Design, the Open Source Initiative, and other um, related organizations trying to put together resources together to help designers contribute open source. So let's do a little bit of getting started with open source. So um, this is my personal definition of open source, and I love to go with this every time. So open source in a nutshell is a free software built by the community for the community with improvements shared across different technical talents in the community. So this is basically what open source is to me, and yeah, across developers, designers, and everyone. So the web has been open source since the view page source. So since um, Chrome um, added the view page source um, and inspect element feature to Chrome browser, it has been open source since then because on any website we can just right click, we can just like tap twice, and we can see the view page source, and we can see the source code of the website, and we can detect what exactly is wrong somewhere. We can see the CSS if we inspect the elements, and we can know what exactly to change if we understand CSS as a designer. 
So yeah, so this is just some of the crappy things that a lot of these engineers say about designers that are really wrong and shouldn't be said. I just want to put it out there. So design is an ideology and not a professional profession. I've heard a, um, a lot of engineers say this and it's wrong and it shouldn't be said. Um, product design is one of the core part of any project at all. If you want to build a successful company, product design is like it's one of the key things to focus on. So if the end product is quality the software, why can't it send us code? So this is another thing that a lot of engineers say that is really wrong. Um, if the end product is quality software, why can't it send us code? This is really wrong. And not all designers is mandated to code, but what's important is um, being able to understand um, how to communicate your design to the developer and him being able to implement it because um, the understanding part is really will help you work in the team successfully with another developer if you can understand. And that's what's more important, not learning how to write code. That's not so important for um, developers. So one so another solution we really need to look at is writing documentation. So we start writing documentation that um, allows designers to um, contribute open source that they can just see and follow along on how basically same way we document API, same way we document um, libraries we build. Let's write documentation to show how designers uh, can contribute open source. It's a trend that someone has to start someday. Um, someone didn't start because they believe someone else would. At the end, no one ends up starting until a couple of years later. So in, probably one eternity later, then someone starts. Then that's probably when, um, yeah, time has really gone and someone needs to start soon. So this is basically some resources you can take a look at if you want to know more about open source, the open source initiative and force and open source Google and all these companies doing open source. So yeah, um, thank you very much. Thank you so much. So let's go ahead and move on to Alexander. Public money, public code. Global problems need global solutions. So you should hear and see me and open my screen. So let's get started with my talk on public money, public code. Um, especially during this corona crisis, we have seen again that global problems need global solutions. And uh, we started some years ago a campaign called Public Money, Public Code on this. And I want to tell you in the next five minutes how this campaign is connected to the current crisis and what happened during the crisis and what are our learnings on this. So first, we um, are the Free Software Foundation Europe a charity and we want to empower users to control technology and this is also true so users are everybody it's like us but it's also government states public bodies and so on and that's why we are trying to reach out to these guys as well so and free software i mean we heard it um, a lot of times already but just again have four freedoms you can use study share and improve the software so you can use it for any purpose the code is transparent so you can uh, see what the software does you can analyze it you can share it um, with others without any limitations um, also the price doesn't matter and you can improve the software which is very important uh, when we uh, um, what we've seen during the crisis and you can modify the software and give it back to the community so the question is why should you and why should governments public bodies support free software and use it so the main the main reason for doing so is that's important for digital serenity so in order to establish trustworthy systems public bodies or you must ensure that you have the full control over the software and the computer systems at the core of your or our state digital infrastructure. So and free software helps here. So and um, also when it comes to um, public bodies, they are financed through taxes, so through our money, and they must make sure to spend the funds in the most efficient way possible. And um, so this is why um, we, we started this campaign. And what we've seen also during the crisis is that global problems need global solutions. And so, for example, um, during this global crisis, we have seen that there are similar demands all in over, all, in all over the world. Um, specific software and specific hardware is and was needed. Um, just think about the tracing apps, uh, uh, software for um, hospitals, also, um, I think this is something we all uh, just recognize we need tools for home office and remote, remote working. And this is also true for public bodies. 
And to have these global solutions, we need interoperability and therefore open standards. So we need the independence through free licenses, free software. We need to collaborate to foster innovation. We need transparency to get acceptance by the citizens for our solutions or by, for the solutions from states. And we should involve as many stakeholders as, uh, as needed and as possible. And therefore, free software is a very good idea uh, and also a very good solution. So, um, as I already mentioned, um, I guess you are more or less all familiar with these Corona tracing apps. Uh, in the very beginning of this debate, we started to get into this debate and said uh, there have to be um, three uh, things happening to um, have uh, successful apps. They have to be used voluntarily, they have to respect fundamental rights, and they need to be free software. And um, what happened is um, that uh, in the very beginning, um, most of the governments tried to um, yeah, find solutions which are proprietary, which are closed source, just for their country. And um, during this debate, it happened that um, governments um, easily understood that it's a better idea to go to free software solutions. And um, in the end, for example, the European uh, Commission, together with the member states, um, just published a paper and said, OK, so if you are going to have these apps, uh, there are some recommendations and you have to openly publish the technical specifications and the source code for the apps. And this is very interesting as a way to maximize reuse interoperability, audibility, and security. So all our arguments have been considered, and most of the governments um, started to work in the open on these apps. Just today, the Spanish government released um, the tracing app for Spain. We have them in Germany and uh, in lots of other countries. Also, a lot of hackathons happened. Um, a lot of um, yeah, public funds were spent for these hackathons in order to find solutions to tackle this crisis. Some of them have been free software, others not. Still, we are in the debate and trying to get as many as possible hackathons to release their solutions as free software. And also for remote working, this is true for us, but also for government public bodies, they have to use a lot of remote working tools. And what happened during the crisis is that most of these um, public bodies first grabbed the first solution they found on the market and then during the crisis they have seen that there are issues with data protection for example with transparency and accept terms and so more and more um, debates are starting to have these remote tools as well as free software and so this is very important for us that we already before the crisis started to demand these public money public code with our um, public money public code campaign and um, during the crisis, um, yeah, this campaign was uh, very important and that we also worked on this issue um, years before. And we are demanding that code paid by the people should be available to the people. So if it's public money, um, the code should be also public and it should be free software in the end. And so um, we would be happy if you could help us with this and um, sign our campaign and support it if you haven't done so far. And yeah, also try to promote it whenever you talk to public servants and tell them that they have to keep in mind that there's something like free software out there. Um, if you have any questions or um, yeah, comments, you can also reach out to me directly uh, via email or social networks, whatever. Um, thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Alexander. Up next, we have Ruth, and her presentation title is A Beginning Inclusive Approach to Open Source. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ruth Ikega from Nigeria, and I'm a Python developer. I write most of the time, technical writer, and I'm an open source enthusiast, mostly a beginner open source enthusiast. And one fun thing about me is I love eating cakes a lot, and especially red velvet cakes. Yeah. So today I'm going to be talking about um, a beginner inclusive approach to open source. Now, as a, if we have beginners here, I would want to say um, open source is a software development practice for developing software in the open with a license that gives rights to users and developers to use, modify, and enhance the software. But to my own definition, to what open source means to me is open source is community collaboration through a software 
and it's it really means a lot to me because um as a beginner i said um, my programming my programming journey in march and i was actually i'm going to share my story of how i got into open source with you in a few minutes so before i got into open source i was just three months into tech so i always i always thought um i was not technical enough so i was even scared to even make an attempt to um to submit a pr to any project i was so scared of doing it but after attending some conferences and talking to some people in the open source space i got to understand that i can contribute as far it's not just code but i can contribute as far documentation i can contribute my ideas so i got into open source then another pain point for me was when i got in i thought i was asking so many questions that were not being answered so there was a fear of asking so many questions i didn't want to um, disturb the maintainers with my so many questions so i was there was this fear of asking too many questions at the same time then another pain point i i I encountered was the new and confusing tools I had to learn because I was just into I was just few months into tech and Git was I think Git was the was the tool that was very confusing for me. I to make my first commit I I had to I had to delete the repository like so many times. I had to I had to um, clone. I had to delete just for a first commit. So other tools that were scary to me, even the communication channels were really very scary. I remember having issues with IRC. I was just popping, and I wouldn't know what to do with it. So that was most of most of the pain points that I I had to en encounter as a beginner. And these these are pain points that you see beginners in tech they actually go through because um, many of them do not even know they can contribute to open source with their little skills. So they're always scared. Okay, I, I don't know how to actually use this tool. So how do we better this experience? Because I'm here to talk about an inclusive approach. This is the state of the source summit. We have come to know about um, the state of the source and how we can make it better. So I'm here to tell you an inclusive approach which I've thought about. Uh, so one first thing I'll start with is empathy. So um, when a beginner pops in, usually they are usually confused on the project. So empathy, you should apply empathy in answering questions from beginners because they, they are most times scared of even asking the question. So even when they when they give that, when they um, sum up that courage to ask the questions, you should apply empathy in answering them. You should create issues that that you explain with context because most of the time when beginners pop into issues even with the good first issue label they're still confused about what the issue is about are we reviewing prs you should be kind enough to understand that this person is a beginner and try to review the prs with with caution and try to correct slightly another thing is hand holding so most of the time i try to as a beginner as i have um, come into open source i try to handhold others to their first pull request so in your open source project as an open source contributor you should you should be open to handholding beginners to their first pull request because once you handholding works like a chain right so once you handhold one person that one person handholds two and two handholds for and good enough if the person is a community helper if the chain just keeps going so hand holding to uh, hand holding a beginner to their first pull request the do's and don'ts around the project and the community can actually go a long way to include beginners in your project another thing i want to talk about is um, reviewing your onboarding process so the world is going diverse and inclusive so you're going to be getting contributors from different parts of the world with different skill sets and different cultural backgrounds you might want to like in review your onboarding process get data from people that were once beginners to see okay how was this step for you was it actually okay how was your experience so you know how to tailor your onboarding process to suit diverse diverse ways so um, there was uh, this there was this conference this google um, open source event i attended last week and there was a particular line i picked up and she said a beginner's mind is a great resource so beginners see things from the from the from a new perspective so every open source project should be inclusive to beginners 
it's not it's not just um, our source code or software design pattern that should be open. We as open source contributors, we as open source maintainers, we as open source enthusiasts, we should be open to new contributors and to feedback. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Ruth. Our last presenter is Emmanuel with his his title being Free Open Source Software Movement in Africa and Beyond. Free Open Source Africa and Beyond. My name is Emmanuel, a software developer, a software engineer at Speedline Solution. I work as a remote and also a design lead and co-founder at Free Open Source Universe in Ghana, advocate for open source. Africa. Africa is, a, Africa is the second largest continent in the world with over 1.3 billion population. Yeah. Um, also, I'm going to use Ghana as a case study. Ghana is where I stay, where I live. I'm from Kumasi, Ghana. Um, Ghana, has, Ghana has more than 70 ethnic groups, which, are, which include Akan, Gan, and so on. Challenges. Challenges. Now, um, now I'll start by talking. Now, let me start talking about the, the movement, the free movement of open source in Africa and the challenges we have within our community. Sometimes when you meet, a, a, um, when, you, when you come across, when you come across some of the um, software engineers in Ghana and you talk about open source, majority of them don't understand um, the use the usefulness of open source and how they can get into open source and, or how they can get started with open source. So um, our community, we sat down and we decided that okay, um, since majority of the software developers in Africa, in Ghana, especially Ghana, doesn't understand the open source movement, so why can't we educate them and why can't we? and do something so that they can all get involved in the community. So now our community, our community focus on basically three things, building open source projects and also events, also mentorship program. Our community, who are we? We are a community of passion technology who dedicate to work towards building, enhancing, and adding value to open source tools in Africa. Yeah, as you can see, this is our first um, open source meetup we had in Kumasi, Ghana. That was around um, November 2019. Currently, our community, we are, in, we are in one country, Ghana, and three major cities in Ghana. We are in Kumasi, Accra, and Takradi. Now, our community, one way uh, we try to create an open source tools, whereby um, we try to create an open source tools whereby people from whereby people from Africa uh, around the uh, people from Africa and Ghana can also showcase their tools on the platform so this uh, this is the first thing we did yeah we created an open source project made by Africa showcasing great projects and tools developed by Africans and ready to contribute to open source. So these are the these are the these are the tools which are be, which are being created by Africans, COVID-19, of data, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so um what 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 are um like the achievement of our community, what we have achieved so far, we are able to we are able to bring the developers and the and designer together 
to introduce them to um to the world of open source um when you go to our gift up page right now we have over 100 uh, we have over 100 developers from africa contributing to open source creating open source tools to help the community so um i think this is the end of my talk thank you so much thank you so much manual